some of these sort of high, higher profile races like Steny Hoyers? Do we know? Uh, is Mar- uh, we're basically just, we don't have any results. Uh, we don't have that many results yet, do we? Well, in Maryland, we do have, I mean, Steny Hoyer was up big. Right. I don't see how they claw that back. I mean, you know, he's a member, when, you, when you're a member of leadership in the House, it's, it's, it is a really hard challenge. Um, and, I, you know, I think Michaela Wilkes, she ran into really the headwinds of COVID. Like, you know, a lot of these challengers, especially in congressional races, you know, a big part of it, you know, what, what AOC uh, used to beat Joe Crowley um, and what Ayanna Presley used to beat Mike Capuana was really a grassroots roots, door knocking centered campaign that you just can't do in COVID. But in these, you know, in state legislative races, on the other hand, you know, it's a lot easier to make a difference. It's a lot easier to uh, access the grassroots. Like in Philadelphia, um, Nikhil Saval, who uh, is a head big on uh, incumbent Larry Farnese, um, he had a very extensive digital and mail program that was aimed at, you know, it's a smaller segment of voters. And so it's a lot easier for something like that to uh, catch on than, you know, Michaela Wilkes just had a much bigger district without the ability to really run uh, the grassroots campaign she wanted. So it's just, you know, it, it's very difficult to knock off an incumbent um, with that's, that in a, in a pandemic uh, condition. That's going to be a big dynamic, right? I mean, I, I feel like uh, there was, we had, as far as I can tell, the biggest, the sort of the, the deepest and biggest pool of progressive challengers to sitting incumbent Congress people, and I would imagine, uh, you know, state Senate, uh, you know, uh, on, on the state level as well, although I'm not, I don't, I don't know that, and you'd know that better, um, that, that I feel like I've ever seen in my lifetime. I mean, is that just in terms of sheer numbers and quality of candidates, is that the case? And, 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 it, and, if, and if so, COVID is going to play a big role in keeping those sort of upset races down, the number of those upset victories down? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say there's been an obvious trend toward more of them. And I think the thing to keep in mind with these is that it's not a one electoral cycle fight. I mean, you, you look at to Illinois, for example, Marie Newman barely falls short in 2018, comes back in 2020 and wins Depends the primary. Right. And I think especially going into 2022, um, that is a redistricting cycle. And that means that all these incumbents, every single one in the country is going to have at least some new turf that they have to run on that they're not familiar with. And so, um, you know, I, you see people, you know, if you see someone fall short that you wanted to win this year, you really shouldn't despair because um, 2022 is going to, you know, you can see that these challenges tend to gain momentum over time and that 2022 the, every incumbent is going to have new turf to defend. So I think you will see a lot more uh, primary challenges. It'll continue to grow and that I think they'll be even more successful um, in 2022. Um, are there any other uh, that we should be, that we should mention? I was, um, I don't know. Was I right to be surprised? I mean, I got to be honest with you. I don't follow New Mexico politics uh, too much. Uh, but I just assumed because uh, Valerie Plain had a sort of bigger national profile uh, that she would win that race. But as far as I can tell, uh, she did not. And uh, that the uh, Teresa Leger Fernandez, who beat her, um, is to her left. Yeah, you know, that in that primary, I think it's hard to say. Um, you know, I think there there was a significant ideological overlap between the two, but uh, you know, Tal- Teresa Leger Fernandez had been in that district. She had specifically worked at organizing in Native communities, and it's a you know that district is very it's a sprawling rural area, uh, very diverse. And you know, if you have that experience organizing in disparate parts of it the way that she does, it really gives you a leg up. And so Plame hadn't lived there for nearly as long, hadn't been involved for nearly as long. And so, you know, money, money certainly helps you win elections. Name recognition certainly helps you win elections. But if you have 
a presence in that community, if you have a record of helping out that community, that's also something that you can run on. And, you know, Plame didn't have those things and Legere Fernandez did. All right. So let's talk about um, that um, uh, explicit uh, racist idiot, Steve King in Iowa. He loses uh to what is this guy's name feinstein or Fen, 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 fernstein fernson randy feinstra feinstra and now uh you, you characterize it as it's the first time that somebody to the to the right within a republican primary has lost um you know in a long time or at least the most high, high profile but we should also remind people right this guy feinstra he uh thinks covid is a hoax that it's, you know, it's, you know, uh, his, his rhetoric is pretty uh, xenophobic towards uh, the Chinese. Um, he was sort of running on the fact that it seems to me that King was no longer effective because he was incompetently racist, uh, as opposed to just being racist, um, and therefore could no longer sit on committees and therefore was not sufficiently supportive of Trump or at least effectively a supportive of Trump. Um, is that, is that a fair characterization? I mean, what am I missing here that, you know, like, I mean, I guess you could say like being more explicitly racist as opposed to just like supporting racist policies uh, or a racist in the pre in the presidency is, you know, I guess marginally to the left of, of Steve King, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that's fair. Um, you know, I didn't say that he was, um, you know, George Romney or Nelson Rockefeller, um, but he is marginally to the left of Steve King. Um, you know, if you look at that race, it really, you know, it it wasn't explicitly about King being too conservative, but it's kind of hard to, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of ignoring the subtext. And the subtext of this race was, Steve King is so far on the conservative fringe that he's an ineffective congressman. And that, and I mean, I will say it is notable that King, you know, had been stripped of his, his, his committee slots. He really wasn't able to raise a lot of money, had very little establishment support, um, had this record of really, you know, being again at the very fringe of the right wing still came within 10% of winning. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it, it's, 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 I think as a net, it's, you know, for anyone, it's good that he's gone. He, I mean, there's one less voice introducing the very fringe of the right wing, the Chuck Johnsons of the world into the halls of Congress. And that, I think that that's still a net good, even if Randy Feenstra will vote the same way. Um, but yeah, it shows you that, you know, it hasn't been cured. They haven't cured themselves of, the you know of, of the um milieu that gives rise to someone like king yeah they won't i i, I don't yeah. I, I, I don't think it i don't i don't think they're going to cure themselves of that for a long long time but is this one of those uh, things where careful what you wish for because uh, now i mean would there was there a chance that uh, that guy jk shulton is that his name shulton um, uh, jd shulton jd yeah. shulton uh could have won against king less of a chance against yeah. feenstra yeah, it, you know, Shulton came within 5% uh, in 2018. Um, in a presidential year, it's possible. I mean, I, there's, it, seems, it seems very unlikely that he would win just because Democrats don't need that seat. Um, so they probably won't spend a ton of resources trying to win it. Um, and especially after the next round of redistricting in Iowa, um, it seems likely that seat will probably get more conservative. And so it just doesn't seem like, a, you know, I mean, Shulton, because he's run against King, because he's, um, you know, he has a, a, a big profile, he'll still be able to raise money. Um, but I, I think he'll, you know, the seat was on the board, but it was never really something that Democrats needed. So the net benefit of having Steve King out of Congress, I think, uh, outweighs, you know, whatever marginal benefit there was to having J.D. Shulton potentially keep that seat for one term. OK, fair enough. Um, let's just look ahead to next Tuesday and then we'll, uh, and then, you know, we'll, we'll talk about Wisconsin. Um, what do you got about next Tuesday? Next Tuesday is another big, uh, primary day, but you know, I imagine it's going to have the same sort of like, it's going to land with a big splat 
and we're not going to really know the results for some time in certain instances, right? Yeah, I you know all the states um, are still trying to figure out, you know, especially um, states that are, have mail-in balloting is a relatively new phenomenon, or at least large mail-in balloting is a relatively new phenomenon. They're taking a while, and you're seeing that in Pennsylvania, you know, this was their first cycle with uh, you know no excuse absentee balloting. And so you're seeing there, you know, it's disparate between counties on just like how quickly they can count these. And the smaller ones are just having a far easier go of it than the larger ones. And, um, you know, like states like Oregon and Colorado and California that have had extensive mail-in balloting in the past and are held up as paragons, you know, they didn't go from zero to 60 right away. It was a process that you know, they developed the ability, the institutional know-how to count mail-in ballots over time. And even in California, um, you know, it takes them weeks to count every ballot. Uh, and, you know, I think it's actually a relatively new phenomenon where Americans expect election results to, like on election night in the past. You know, if you go to the very beginning of the, of the country that, you know, just technologically wasn't possible. And I think we kind well, of I know but that to, was that was that was 250 years ago. Yeah. But I mean, even like in the, you know, going back to the earlier in the 20th century, um, it, you know, you, you just didn't get election results that quickly. It took a while to compile everything. Um, and so, well, well let me ask you um, this, Aaron. You know, we, Aaron. We need to well, go back to that where we don't expect winners right away. Aaron, we're not going to wait. We're just not going to. I'm not going to. I refuse to. I know. Patience uh, is a virtue. Um, but wh- why don't, don't they count the ballots as they come in? It, it, you know, it's it's one of those things where, People develop these systems over time about counting ballots. And um, I, I think that, you know, there are certain rules um, against actually like count, you know, you, you can't like open the, it, I, I don't think in any state anyone actually like opens the ballots and counts the votes before election day. Um, or, uh, or I think it's pretty uncommon and really, but it's really more an administrative task of just like, being able to, you know, physically open ballot, up you know, all those ballots. Is it, yeah. Or, and, or, you know, scan them or, you know, or, you know, whatever procedures you have, because the most important thing that anyone working in election offices is to get the numbers right. That is the most important thing. And so that needs to be the imperative of way beyond, you know, it's, it's far more important than speed of reporting is getting the numbers right. Uh, I, I think speed more important than getting the numbers right. I just want to know it. Let's let's find out. Um, I'm joking, of course, Aaron. Um, I'm a little cranky. L- let's talk about this report that you guys did uh, about Wisconsin. Wisconsin had two different um, primaries, um, well, which is yeah. or, or or elections, I guess I should say that. Were that which is in and of itself just insane. Like, like that's. I, I guess we have a thing called best practices. That that to me seems like worst practices. Forget COVID. Just the idea that you would have like we're going to do an election a month apart because because. Um, yeah. But um, talk about why that's the case, and then what that provided a sort of natural experiment too, didn't it? Or at least some, uh, I guess maybe a research project. Yeah. Um, so Wisconsin, um, as many of you know, was really ground zero for, um, the right wing's experiment in just totally dismantling public institutions. Um, and you know, there was a backlash against that people in the state consistently, have decided, no, that's not what they want. In 2018, Democrats got a majority of the vote for basically everything they ran for. But because the state legislature is so gerrymandered and because the Supreme Court says that's totally fine, uh, Republicans still hold a very large majority in the state legislature. And so when the governor, Tony Evers, said, you know, hey, we're in the midst of a pandemic. Let's try to move these elections out um, until, you know, people get a little, um, you know, more health, you know, until the pandemic subsides a little bit, maybe consolidate them. The Republican legislature, which thrives on making sure that people can't vote, said, no, uh, we will not move this uh, Supreme Court election scheduled in April um, or we won't move it to a mail-in balloting. We're going to force people to vote in person in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and so, you know, they held this state Supreme Court election. Uh, it was two months. I know it seems like two years ago, but it was only two months ago that uh, they held this really prominent 
state Supreme Court election in the midst of the pandemic. And it was supposed to be close. Um, I think heading into Election Day, people thought the Republic, the conservative candidate was 